Assalamu alaikum and welcome back everybody to English Poetry at the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, today we move from the Romantic uh, poetry uh, to the Victorian age. The Victorian age is named after uh, a very famous, one of the most uh, long reigning uh, British or English uh, monarchs, Queen Victoria. Until recently, Queen Victoria was the longest reigning monarch or queen. England has been uh, blessed, I don't know, with uh, female monarchs. We have Elizabeth 40 something years, we have uh, Queen Victoria 60 something years, and then we have Queen Elizabeth II nowadays, the longest reigning monarch. And can you imagine that? Somebody con controlling more or less, because it's now symbolic, more than political, a country for more than 60 years. Sometimes you have to pity, somebody was like saying, I pity Queen Elizabeth uh, II's son because he's almost dead and he hasn't tasted a, a day of the throne. Anyway, so in many ways, this age is, uh, is different. As, you know, I don't like to speak about different eras as in terms of black and white uh, features. It doesn't mean that when the romantics uh, are no longer there when Wordsworth died. Because, you know, Wordsworth sort of started the Romantic movement and he died and then we, we had the, the second, the, the Victorian age. Uh, it doesn't mean that once he dies, once those people die, everything finishes and we turn into something else. The same thing with the, the Victorian age. When people say Victorian literature doesn't mean the moment Queen Victoria started, uh, um, you know, uh, her uh, rule, it, everything changed, everything started to be uh, something. That's why you'll see some people um, giving dates even 15 years before Queen Victoria and 15 years after she died, describing this as the Victorian, the Victorian age, as a, as a, as a, as a label, as a term of, of convenience. But in many ways, uh, the last years of the Romantic age with, with, with Shelley, uh, and, and his you know, friends started, who started to be more involved in the social issues of the, of the, of the society, of the community, rather than just you know, create your own imagination and uh, do whatever the first generation of the Romantics did. Uh, in many ways, the many of the Romantic, uh, the Victorian poets were an extension to this thing. They were heavily involved in, in the society, in their, in their community. When we talk about the Romantic, the, the Victorian age, we speak about uh, England being or Britain being the, the most powerful uh, empire ever, the richest country ever, London becoming even more powerful, uh, richer than any uh, other country, any other capital around, uh, around the world. And with that, we talk about social problems, we talk about economical problems, we talk about poverty, we talk about, um, about working conditions, we talk about uh, so many crises that plague the the society. I remember again what our friend Shelley said, how the society uh, was uh, in, in a way imploding or self-destructing because the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poor, poorer. The same thing, of course, uh, continued. Uh, in terms of poetry, poetry was different in its sensibility. In many ways, we'll see uh, in, in the coming, today and in the coming classes how, that, how different the poetry uh, was. Today we have two poems. One by Tennyson, Alfred Tennyson, Lord Alfred Tennyson, and a second one by, by Thomas Hardy. We discuss the poems, and then probably if we have time, we can reflect on how they reflect the age, or we can leave that until next class. Okay, so we have The Eagle by Alfred Lord Tennyson. According to many, he's the most famous Victorian poet. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this, William Wordsworth for, for a long time was the poet laureate. You know the poet laureate, the, the term? Like, of, exactly, like the official poet of the country. And this is interesting because many people don't know this. Meaning he was the poet of the establishment. Many people believe that this is why at the, end, the, the ending years, you know, he was, at the end of his time, he was more conservative than anybody else. 
Okay. Now, when he died, it was Alfred, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson, who became the poet laureate, the official poet of the of the kingdom, okay, of England. This is a very, 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 very short poem, as you can see, consisting of two stanzas, three lines each. Let's see what we can make about it. And look at the, the title, the eagle. It's not an idea, it's not it's this concrete thing, it's an animal, a bird. So he clad, so with, if you don't have the, uh, the title, you don't know the title, and you start with he clasp, clasps the crag with crooked hands, you don't, you don't know whether this refers to a man or a bird or something. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. That's simple. Somebody read, please. Like a thunder bolt, he falls, please. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crowds. Crawls. Crawls. He watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunder bolt, he falls. Very good. He watches. That should be two syllables. Watches. Very good. One more, please. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure wall, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. A thunderbolt, he falls. One more. Somebody, please. He clasps the crab with crooked hands. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. You know crawl? Like babies. You know when babies, before they were toddlers? Yes. They crawl. What do you think? How, how should we read this poem? What atmosphere, what tone should there be? Is this a sad poem? Yeah. Celebratory? Gloomy? Dark? Positive, negative? Is the poet celebrating the eagle? Is it about the eagle? Is this what well, we'll talk about probably how is this a romant is this romantic? Because this is a natural element, a natural uh, setting here. So how would you read this poem? Like if you are alone, you're not, you know, shy or something. You're alone and you want to read it in a particular way. How would you do it? It reminded me of The Tiger by William Blake. He like, there he was fascinated by how he looked and how he moved. And such. Mm. I, I feel like this one is too similar. He's, he's fascinated, he's appreciating the eagle. It could be symbolic as well, but mm. it also could be the ego himself. Okay, so both. So in, in both cases, how would you read this? How would you read the poem, like in terms of tone and atmosphere? With like Pride, celebration, you're celebrating the, the fascination. eagle. Fascination, a sense of awe, yeah. Yeah. sense of wonder. I think I would look at it as some kind of tragic flaw of a, 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 like a tragic hero falling down or something. Because so you're going here, remember we said usually a poem is its ending. Usually. A poem is its, its ending. Like many, the, everything counts, of course. It's a short text. Everything counts. But the ending is where the poet is taking us. He's telling us, look here. So it could start with a positive t note, positive tone. He clasps because this is a, there's here somebody boasting about something, like praising something. 
He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. If this is a man, this is symbolic. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure, you know azure? Blue. If you like football, the Italian team is described as the azuri. Azraq. So, ringed is the color of the sky. The azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea, look at, I love the description, we talk about this, the adjectives here. There's crooked, you know, crooked Hillary. And then there is lonely, and then the azure, and then the sea is wrinkled. It's not smooth, you know? It's wrinkled. Beneath him crawls. He watches. So the, the standing here is significant. There's just fixed movement. He's standing still. The bird, the man, this man is standing still, watching. And that's significant here. He watches from his mountain walls. The, the positive, his mountains, this is his walls. And it's interesting how his mountain walls could be mount, of course, because this rhymes perfectly. Hands, lands, stands, a, a, crawls, walls, and falls. It could be his mountain, could have been his mountain rocks, his mountain stones, his mountains, many things. But there's this idea about walls being man-made rather than natural elements. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. So I, I thank you for going to the ending here and highlighting the fact that the, the falling here is what gives the whole poem this tone of inevitability. But what kind of fall, we don't know. You know, sometimes uh, birds, thank you very much, birds fall. If this, is a, if this is the eagle, we see eagles all the time, if you watch videos, just fall down to catch a prey, to, to kill some, some, something, hunting. Please. I think it's a, it, gives, it gave me at least negative connotation because uh, like the word close to the sun gave me, a, or alludes to when we call mm. it the waxed wings and I think we mentioned Interesting, mythology, yeah. So I think this is how I thought that it's kind of negative. So aiming high, flying high is good, but this is too high. This is close to the sun. In the ancient mythology, what's the name of that? Um, the man God, uh, and when he when he flew close to the sun, and then the wings melted, and then inevitably f fell down. Okay, so it's good that sometimes knowing too much is you know, is not good because you'll spoil the fun, like very quickly. So you you see the the allusion to to ancient mythology. Okay, now. What, what do you notice about the, uh, the word choice? I just mentioned something about the word choice. Uh, let's begin with adjectives, for example. Crooked hands. I don't know why. If this is a bird, the hands, are the hands the, the legs or the wings? He says close, right? Where's? OK. Close to the sun, in the hands, ring it. Exactly. That's that's. I find it very interesting. So this this is we talk about the legs rather than the hands. Okay. So the hands are the legs, which is weird. Okay. So the crooked hand, the lonely lands. Is the land empty, or is this bird? Alone, alone, all alone. He's too, far too far away, isolated, yeah, entrapped. What's that? He's the land. Probably because there's this thing, his here, the the pronoun his, like he owns this, but he's lonely, he so and he is alone. This is a singular noun. He's alone and lonely. And the the sea, the wrinkled sea. I've never seen this description before. You know wrinkles? What, what's wrinkles? So it's somebody's face. So this is old, right? That's, that's not something young or new. 
the Renkil Tsi, and we'll talk about the, the, the personification here. The Renkil Tsi beneath him crawls. He, the eagle, watches from his mountain walls. The walls are like mountains, they're high, very huge. And like thunderbolt, he falls. Now, if this is about uh, an eagle, the use of the pronouns his and he and his and him and he and he, there's, there's a him, what's him? Beneath him, yeah. These, like there are too many of them. One could be enough. Sometimes it gets you confused, like why is there a he when he's talking about a bird or an animal? But he's opening the poem with he stands, creating suspense because you don't know who this he is. If you don't know the title, you don't know who's he. If you read the title, if you know the title, it's going to probably suggest that this symbolizes something. So there is a, the personification here of the eagle is very, it's, I don't think this is going to be a very difficult uh, symbol to, to get, okay? Because we usually have this. So he clasps, he, 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 he for, he is, his and, and one him. Suggesting again that this bird, he, he could be giving these, you know, human features, traits to the bird itself and that's it. He's just fascinated by a bird, possible. But I think the symbolism is very clear, very glaring. The bird symbolizes something. What do you think? What does the symbol here, please? What came to my mind is that this poem is about a political regime under revolution, for example. Hmm. Where are the people here? Walls. Where are the people in the text? No, it's not the people. It's the president himself. Mm. The You're saying watching the people? Do you think? Yes. Watching? watching. It doesn't say. You're watching what? doesn't say. So, but you, you, you're reading this as watching his, mountain the people, walls. the masses. Yeah. Mountain walls, he, uh, he's not allowed to be with the people. So he's in a mountain. He's not allowed? Does he have a choice? No, no he doesn't have a choice, but they're rebelling against him. They're refusing okay. him. If you're saying, well, again, if, if you're saying he's not allowed, somebody, something prevents him from, if it's the revolution or something. But I think this is a choice. A leader chooses to distance and isolate himself or herself from, from the people. Why would, why would people be rebelling against somebody? Probably because originally he is flying up above. He is detached from reality. He's isolated. He has, like, rules for a long time, like the ring Okay, so possibly, I, okay, I like this, I'll, go, I'll get back to this in, in a bit. So you, you, you're seeing that this eagle is actually a symbol of a political regime, a regime, a president, or, or what? You're shaking your head, or what? I don't think so, I feel like uh, there's a feature in the eagle that uh, uh, this... Uh, so there's no, 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 no symbolism whatsoever in the poem? Okay. So I feel like that's that's what what's what people do usually. He's yes. like you know he's look he's he's staring at something like an eagle because you know yes. the sight and how it's powerful or something. Is there symbolism here in the text? Forget about what we do. The text here does the text suggest that there is symbolism or not? Can we consider the tone to be about the bride? Since I, I don't uh, I don't see any symbolism in the text. Mm. Since Tennyson is the you know, see, see how sometimes uh, background information about the poet would spoil your understanding of the poem? I think he, he the fact that he is, that, that's a very good point. The fact that he is the poet of the kingdom, the official poet of the kingdom, doesn't necessarily mean he would be all the time praising the kingdom and suggesting that it's perfect and we should always uh, obey them. No, the lion. The lion is. 
the lion. I think it's the, the bald eagle is, is in, in America. But if you don't know that this is Alfred Tennyson, or I didn't just stupidly uh, tell you that he is the poet uh, laureate and was the famous, most famous uh, poet of England in the Victorian age, would you consider this opinion? That's why new critics say uh, information about the age, the background information about the text, and you know, could be interesting, but there should be a relevant to our understanding of texts. Read the text from the text. A close reading of the text, please. I'm not denying that there could be some, or it could be read as a symbolic poem, but for me, I can't relate to poem. I don't think there is any symbolism. Mm. I think it's only a glorification of the power of the evil. And I, this poem actually drew a picture in my mind. You know, like in movies when they bring the eagle standing on a cliff, and you know, the camera moves like. But even if, cliff. even if this is in a movie, it would be symbolic of something. You know, because sometimes th this could be foreshadowing of something, yes. some kind of fall. Be the, the first scene of the movie, then the sometimes, or somewhere in the middle when, you know, the protagonist is, you know, mm -hmm. so about to fall, like, the yeah, police. But if you... if Okay, but uh, th so in this, in this regard, you're taking he falls, not as the falling down, the decline, no, no, but no. as to catch, to catch a prey. Again, the to make... Fall to make him even more powerful than before. Because if, if this is up and watching and close to the azure and flying close to the sun and you're hungry, imagine what happens if this is on a, in a, full, on a full stomach. Please. Okay. So again, we have here a symbolism. Palaces. Uh, palaces Not only palaces. Okay. Usually walls are used to protect something, and eagle, uh, he used the negative uh, image of eagle. Thank you very much. So you're not taking the personification, the he, 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 and also the fact that this is uh, using walls. Probably you can use the personification in the wrinkled sea, and also the sea crawls, and the hands here as, example, as examples or to support the symbolic reading of the text. That's very beautiful. That's really very beautiful. I like okay. from all the war and politics and everything. If I read it just like this, I would imagine someone who is like who got really old and he has no one around him. So he might be trying to commit suicide because, like, uh, I don't know, the wrinkles. See, maybe he is really old. Uh, Aging, walls, disease. His his life is just like walls and separating him from uh, enjoying. The older you go, the more separ separated and isolated exactly, yes. uh, you become. One more. Mm. So it's a feature. Another mm. thing is we can take this not as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. He's alone. He doesn't need help. He's powerful enough to support he himself. And okay, that's the thing. Okay. Say again. I can investigate it from the last two months, from the first stamp, that he is anything have a strong power, not only the political regime. Maybe Could be, like, that, that's what Noah is suggesting here. This shouldn't necessarily be a political poem about regimes or dictators, it could be about us. We are full of life, we're powerful, we're strong, in our prime, we do th stuff, but then when, as we age and get more and more, you know, weak and feeble and lonely, perhaps, we just like that, we fall down. Not sure, I don't know how you're reading suicide into this, but it could be the ending of somebody. Yusra? Too proud, yeah. Uh, but he forget that he was getting weak uh, and fall down someone, someday. That's, that's possible. It doesn't necessarily have to be about a powerful person. Everybody of us is an eagle at one point or another. Mm -hmm. But then we could go there. Also now, the if you notice the present, this is not about something that happened. The present simple tense here clasps watches. and stands watches. and crawls and watches and falls. Give this idea of the continuity. This is what this is inevitable. This is in life. It keeps happening yes. to everybody. Even sometimes you have uh, a, a tyrant, a villain, like uh, a dictator, uh, who comes after a dictator is dethroned or, 
you know. And then the, uh, the, the other guy keeps following the same horrible steps. People don't learn from their own mistakes. People never learn from others. And that's why like, there's this funny thing about history. H history repeats itself because man is too stupid you know, to avoid and keeps repeating the same mistakes. Yeah, you can, you could. If you want to take it as, uh, if, if this is a William Blake poem, it could be a highly symbolic poem. If it is a Wordsworthian poem, it could be just a poem where the poet is just fascinated by, by the eagle, but without the, you know, lonely would be positive, like, well not lonely, the tone would be a lot more lighter and, and optimistic. How is that? He falls, the eagle, he is uh, a symbol of the romantic age, who decline, which declines in the that, That's possible, but I think with stretching the text uh, 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 too much. I think, I think like in forming, in confirming the identity of God, the form, you said that it, it is an eagle. Could be so both. When he, fall, when he falls, then he will be stronger than that because he will eat. So sometimes it's like a wisdom that when you fall, Maybe you'll be uh, you know, we see this all the time. Yeah. It's it's not uh, if you fall, don't worry. Yeah. It's not it's not your fault. Sometimes if you fall, the most important thing is to rise again, yeah. to learn from your mistakes. You should read for Tennyson. He has very very long poems, but the, his shorter poems are really good. I, I don't, I can't. I know it's the age of the novel. And no, I but I, I, I still don't want to say that uh, a particular group of poets didn't use symbolism. Symbolism is everywhere. I know. And don't forget, if you want to judge this way, don't forget that in the Romantic age, usually the, the sense, the tone of sadness and loss was dominant. But like, if you look at the 20th century poetry, almost every poem is symbolic. Baldo, not necessarily. You can't necessarily, uh, generalize. There's a lot of symbolism in the 20th century. A lot more than, much, much than we have here. But here we have the allusion here. Would, would you want to uh, reject also the fact that this is uh, an allusion to ancient mythology? Yes. Getting close to the sun? No, it could be. I'm saying it could be read symbolically, but mm. like, I prefer to read it this Finally. way. Finally? Uh, I want to say something that because the, posi uh, the positive image of, of uh, uh, eagle for, for us, I think I will, I will go for a person who is, uh, has a passion and, uh, uh, and uh, walk in, in, in a long way. Uh, uh, even if he uh, or she is alone, uh, and then he falls, not falls to fall, no, he falls to get the suitable chance uh, for, for him or for her. If, if this falling is a choice, if this falling is a choice, this is the fall that should, you know, the fall shall further the flight in me. But here he, he will you know, George, comes. we studied this, George Herbert, the fall shall further the flight in me. You fall, you fall to... to uh, to rise. So, if you look at this, I highlighted some things here. The, uh, the poem is very concrete. It comes to life because of the choice of words, the nouns we have here, the concrete nouns we have here, like crag, you know, the, the rocks and the mountain, the lands, the sea, the mountains. They create a sense of place, a sense of direction, a sense of, they make the, the, very po the poem itself very vivid, vivid and concrete, like you said, imagining this. There are many modifiers like uh, crooked and lonely and azure and wrinkled. They, again, develop in a way our sense of perspective. And I think they also direct and reinforce the, uh, in, in many ways, the especially like, I, I, don't, I, don't like, I think crooked and wrinkled in many ways similar. Yeah. And lonely with coming to the sun gives a sense of, of, you know, of loss, in a way, of negativity at least. The hands, not claws, or wings, or legs, reinforces the personification of the eagle. The eagle is the eagle, but basically it could be a symbol of, of a man, a person, not necessarily a man. Walls, not rocks, not any natural thing, despite this is predominantly about nature, right? 
connotes man-made structures as opposed to nat the natural setting we have here. This is a man-made structure. So if you, if you want to focus on these things, these, the personification and the, uh, the man-made structure the, being the walls, uh, this again uh, uh, develops the idea that the, uh, that the eagle is a symbol of, of uh, a ruler, a dictator. If you look at the grammar, uh, the statements are all declarative, present simple tense. They convey the meaning matter-of-factly and they give the idea that this is a continuous thing, a circle. It keeps happening. It's inevitable. The word order, I love the word order. You should pay attention more to this. Look at this. He stands. He falls. Okay. Even... He watches. Uh, now he watches subject verb. This is how we not normally begin sentences, right? But he clasps, he watches, they just matter of factly here. But look at this. Close to the sun in lonely land. Okay. We don't even get directly to the subject verb here, to the declarative statement. Ringed, surrounded with azure world, he stands. That's the, this creates some kind of suspense there. This is delayed. This, we call this a delayed close here, main close. And the same thing happens here. He watches from his mountain walls and like a thunderbolt, he doesn't attack, he doesn't fly, he doesn't, any other word, he falls. And basically, generally speaking, a fall is negative. A fall is negative. Until, unless you want to read it in this positive sense that this is... Uh, a bird just watching there, waiting for the right moment to attack the prey. And eagles do this all the time. Like? Can be a fun? Kind of. Fall? Yeah. Like? Possible. I don't see it, but possible. So the word order is significant as it delays the main closes in he stands and he falls, creating some kind of suspense, some kind of waiting. Sometimes it could suggest that this falling and this standing takes a long time. Like again, a ruler who rules for a long time. The singular eagle and lonely both indicate that despite the space, all the space, the bird or what it stands for, if it stands for something, both uh, is both isolated, even detached and entrapped. So yes, he owns the world. Yes, he flies close to the sun. He owns the world, his uh, whatever. This bird is alone and isolated, in a way, entrapped. You know, entrapped, it's in a trap of its own creation because there are no people around, alone. See the point here, the singularity of these words, they suggest that the bird is isolated and entrapped, even detached from reality, far, far away. Assuming again that the C stands for the people, the people that is suffering, that is in, in, in pain, and that is wrinkled, aging. Delaying the last clause, he falls again, creates suspense and heightens the sense of power in the bird's action as it falls. This is a very powerful, but not an ordinary uh, bird. And finally, the rhetorical features here, the simile, there's a simile here. You know, usually a simile is simpler than uh, a, a metaphor, right? brings about the images of the natural and the godlike and even the ancient mythology. Uh, Thor, Zeus, what, what, what's that? Uh, uh, the powerful uh, uh, image of the, uh, and Thor also, you know? Uh, there's the symbolism here, however you take it. And I think, finally, that this is a very significant personification here. The wrinkled sea standing for the people. It's personified by the word wrinkled, and it's also personified more by the verb crawls. There's a binary here. The bird flies up above, but the sea is down far below. And it also doesn't move as fast as the bird can. It just crawls. It's very slow. It doesn't move quickly. Basically a sign of weakness. But there could be some kind of paradox. If it is wrinkled, babies can be wrinkled sometimes, right? Not, only, not always smooth, right? 
But if babies, if, if this is something very old, aging because of the wrinkles, how is it crawling? Probably in a second childhood or, or something. I don't know how, how much of the age we have in this, in this poem. We'll see when we finish with another, another text. One last point. A rebellion, like, you know, an uprising. It's wrinkled, so it has lots of ways, it has lots of stuff. So, okay, you're taking this as a yes, positive, as a uh, movement? Kind of. I think, like, as a literal meaning or as a literal okay. uh, description, it's like it has lots of storms and wind and stuff. So this is why the sea is full of waves and... Uh, I, I see no, no reference to winds and storms here. It's just the sea, the waves... Positive describing the waves as, the, the sea as, not clear, not calm, but tranquil. Could indicate, okay, I can see your point here. It could indicate some kind of, of, of movement. We'll move, for the sake of time, we'll move to the second uh, text by Thomas Hardy. Uh, Tennyson, in a way, opens the Victorian age, and it ends with our friend here, Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy, by the way, died sometime around uh, 1930, 1920, 28. So he lived like more than a quarter of the uh, 20th century. But he's a Victorian age. He's a famous uh, novelist, a famous short story writer, and also a famous uh, uh, poet. The poem, also the oxen, a name of an animal. Hmm. Is that animal abuse? Okay. If you look at the text, one, two, three, four. That's four stanzas, four lines each. Also a very short poem. I'll give you, uh, I want to give you two minutes to look at the text because it's basically divided into two parts. We have stanzas one and two being one part and then it shifts to a second uh, uh, image or world view with the second, uh, uh, the third and fourth stanzas. I want to give you two minutes. Look at the text. That's page 122. And I want you to find the, you know, the binaries. We mentioned my binaries b before. The binaries are the opposites. Where can you locate opposites? Again, between stanzas one and two, and stanzas two, uh, three and four, sorry. Look at your text. Just circle the words that you, you find, you know, different. Between the two uh, parts. One, two versus three, four. Okay. One minute. What differences are there between the first part and the second part of the poem? Circle or underline the words you find different. Could be a word or a phrase or
done. Good. Okay, I'll give you one one minute to share your uh, ideas with your friend. What did you highlight? Talk to your classmate. See if you highlighted the same things and if you highlighted different things and why. Talk to your friends here. No Arabic. You done? It's been just thirty seconds. Are you done? So how many things have you highlighted? Four things. Okay. Have you highlighted the same thing? But have basically the same thing. Okay. Okay, could you please share with me and with the rest of the class what you highlighted? Please. Did you work with a friend? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. There's elder here and there is childhood over there. Very good. Please. Flock and lonely. Fascinating. This here, please. Doubt. There's doubt. But here, doubt. Where's no? Okay. But if you notice, you're used to know. And this is not doubt. Not doubt. Please. Okay, and? Opposites. We're talking about opposites now. Step one, opposites. Is there an opposite for this here? Does it indicate something? Please. Is possible and there's gloom here, in the gloom. Thank you. Now, but also notice this is in, in inverted commas. Yeah, if you report this, now it's going to become then and these years. More, please. I think not, not, not that because it is negative. Then it is binary, it's might. Might? Because might, yeah. Thank you. So there's here Without some idea doubt. about nor with doubt. That's a very good point. Please. Uh, we pictured and I feel. Pictured. Okay, there's possibility also here. We pictured. One more. Oh, yeah, I love this very much. There's we here. And is there any collective? And also another we? There's also us, right? But here, oh, we have I feel. I should, and also the singular someone. That's a very good point, excellent. One more, please. Okay, we talk about why and how later on. So this is hoping it might be so. And here? No, what is the, the phrase or sentence that is opposing this? To doubt, we don't doubt, we hope. We hope against hope. That's very good. Now, in many ways, people who like to analyze texts in this way, they say, okay, look at the binary opposites. If you understand what the bi binaries are saying, are doing, like because they create some kind of tension in the poem, conflict. If you resolve this, so why is there old and young? Why is old, old and child? Why is we and I? Uh, 
uh, nor doubt, and then we hope or might. Is there anything else you highlighted? Somebody highlighted that because there is. Please. I think the heart side and then gloom. Heart or ease and gloom. Possible. More. There's one significant binary. No, I want to say about the tenses. Thank you very much. I think this is the significant point. Yeah, so here, this is mostly past because there is sa said, sat, and dwelt, pictured, and did occur, where. But here, this is basically. Present simple, like like in I feel, I should, I should, could be also, doesn't necessarily have to should and might and 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 would doesn't necessarily. Uh, there's something else I noticed yesterday. Sorry. There. We have there here. Then, but okay, so this is in the past. All people here are here. We are, there is we togetherness. We are certain, there is no doubt. But here, everything is the opposite. If you look at the words, the word choice, the diction here, this is basically positive. Right? Look at embers. He doesn't even say fire. Fire is good, gives, gives warmth, but fire could be negative sometimes. But the embers here, the, the ending of a fire it, that gives us warmth. Meek and mild, you spoke about meek and mild. Look at the m -m -m. meek and mild. The alliteration here, the, the meek, the, the, the opposite of wild. But here the words are in the gloom. And we have an alliteration, fancy Yep, probably this. So fair a fancy few would weave. <laughs> this sound, the alliteration here. I think he's suggesting this makes it musical in a sense, but also suggests that whatever we had in the past, it's gone with the wind because the so fair a fancy few would weave. So fair a fancy. F we have seen this many times, the f, f sound expressing despair, loss, pain, agony. But I, it also gives the idea of the wind taking everything from the past, the memories, the good old days. Okay. So if, if uh, one, one thing I wanted to say, uh, you, you spoke here about no doubt here and knowing and pictured and not having to double check on what the old man said. The old man says things and we like, we take it for granted. But here, look at if. Doubt, not when. Remember Shakespeare, he says, when in my line, in my eternal lines, he was confident. He was sure about this, certain. But yeah, if, and look at this. I'm not sure some of you doubted that this is present simple tense. This is a present simple uh, in meaning. Remember, if, conditional if, rule number one, present meaning, present tense. Rule number two, the meaning is present or future. But the tense is past because it indicates impossibility or it, the fact that this is unlikely to happen. To report a speech, come see the ox and So it It's not about that. It's, it's uh, grammatically speaking. If I say, if you win, give me something. I'm certain that you will win. Now there's a strong possibility. But if I say, if you won, would you do this? I'm not certain. I'm doubting your ability to win. Like when I say, uh, if I become president, I will cancel all exams. I am sure I will be president. I'm confident. I have the self-esteem to make me so say this. But I would say, if I became president, I would cancel exams. Both sentences in their meaning are in the present simple tense and the future. But I use past, like when you say, if I were you. This is present simple. If I were you, I would do this. If I were in Jerusalem, I would do this and that. I am not in Jerusalem. It's impossible. Okay? So we get this idea that this poem is about, it's, it cr uh, creates two worlds. Two worlds here. The world of the past and the world of the present. In the past, we were together. together. We, us. We were flocking in a group. 
elder people had their, you know, place, position there. They were there, they were in command, in authority, they were giving us wisdom. They were bringing, like glue bringing us together. There is warmth here by the embers. Look at the heart side ease, like the good old days, you know. Probably you're too young to feel this, but we get this all the time from older people. Oh, the old good old days. We cherish those, those days. The idea is that Christmas Eve as a religious, I don't think this is a religious text, but this is a religious occasion that had, has become a symbol of bringing people together. And 12 of the clock, you know, we say 2 o'clock. This is originally what it is. The O in o'clock is of the clock because there was used to be one clock in the whole town. And people say it's 2 of the clock. But by time, it became o'clock. Now they are all on their knees. They, if, if we don't, again, if we don't have a title here saying oxen, who's they? Okay. Now, now they are on their knees. This is a sign of supplication, praying. An elder man said as we sat in a flock. I love the fact he, he uses the word flock, which is generally used for animals to describe people. As if we are as meek, as sheepish, as obedient, as like all would be following one man, one person, willingly and happily and gladly. Sat in a flock by the embers in a heart side ease. What, ha what do we do? Do we run to check? Oh, come on, old man. This is a superstition. You're losing it. It's impossible because, by the way, uh, animals, if you see cows, and they usually, mainly they sit this way on their knees. So this is an old man interpreting this as some kind of a, a Christian uh, uh, thing. We pictured, we imagined the meek and mild creature. The, even the word meek and mild indicate this meekness. The meh sound. Creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen. Nor did it, look at the subject verb inversion here, the emphasis. Emphasizing again certainty, unity, togetherness. Nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt. They were kneeling then. We never even ha had a slight, a shred of doubt. Not even this tiny bit of doubt. We believed the man. We took that for granted. We believed in everything. And then look at how the wind takes. I've gone with the wind. So fair a fancy if you would weave. And I think this is one of the most beautiful uh, metaphors or images you could ever have. So fair a fancy, a fancy this idea, this idea that, uh, I don't know, like people together and the animals kneeling also in supplication and in prayer, worshipping, uh, uh, and weave, you know, weave, you weave clothes, you weave a t-shirt, you weave something to, to wear. So the metaphor here is that this image, this idea is like a uh, piece of cloth that is being weaved by somebody. It's beautiful. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. I like the cesura here. In, in these years. There's a pause here. <sighs> like a sigh. Remembering. Gone. Remembering. Pausing there for a moment. Yet, and I look, the yet is, comes like a punch here. Yet, I feel if somebody, if someone said on Christmas, there are two Christmases here. It's that one and this one. Come, see the oxen kneel. And look at this, this imperative thing here. This is someone we don't know whether this is a young person or an old person, but it's just somebody. Come, see the oxen kneel. In the lonely barton by yonder coombe, there, over there. Our childhood, the fact this, we, this is something we used to have, to see, to feel, to trust, to believe in. Our childhood used to know. So here there's just one statement by the old man and you take it for granted. But here somebody's like, well, not trying to remind you of the childhood. I should go. I should go. And they usually when I tell you if you should see him, it's more polite and also creates doubt. If you should see Ali, you know this in, in F, you can go check uh, your grammar. That's why I say understanding poetry and literature in general, but poetry in particular, makes your English special.
because you know, you know the difference is why this, why not that, we, what's the difference between we and I, I here creates individuality, fragmentation, isolation, but we brings unity and certainty and togetherness. I should go with him. So this is a, a, a male, a man, a young man, a woman, in the gloom, should be in the dark, but gloom makes it you know, bleak. I don't know why he used gloom here. Of course it rhymes with kum, but again, gloom has this pessimistic tone to it, in the gloom. It's dark, but also psychologically speaking, I am not in the mood, probably, I'm not, I'm no longer the person I was when I was a child and innocent and pure. Hoping it might be so. Even might is not certain, it's less certain than the fact here in they are, matter of factly again. They are, that's a fact. N not they could be, they seem to be. The old man was certain, we were certain, we believed this old man. And here finally, if somebody says, come see the oxen kneel, I, would, I should go, hoping. Yeah, and hoping any doubting, and there's doubt, at least 50%, you know, it might be so. Hoping the animals, the ox and the creatures would be kneeling. In the past, present, this is a man who's, this was written, I think around uh, 1915, uh, uh, so at the end of the Victorian age, probably this man lived a long life, so he is, you know, cherishing those old, good old days. Possible, yeah. But where, where is him? So he's one of the, he's one of the children, yeah, yeah. Correct. So he's one of the children, flocking. You take that for granted. The monster under the bed or the monster in the closet. We believed that. We believed all these superstitions from our grandparents. We took them for granted. Although probably deep in your heart, I have uh, my grandma, God bless her soul. She told us so many stories and many stories, even when I was a kid, I, ne I never believed. I said, come on. You know? But again, you would love to listen to these stories. You would sit for hours and hours and listen to her till, uh, because there's this special connection about stories. There's this special thing about your, so your heart would be receiving this, receptive of this, but your mind would be like in doubt. But because, not because like of, uh, she lies, but because the stories include like superstitions, like a pair of slippers moving at night or like, <laughs> Uh, a tree making some kind of a human voice or something. But any other story about people, we would take these stories for granted when she tells you stories about your mom or dad or even your granddad, although your granddad would say that never happened, you would believe her over your, your granddad. Okay, so yeah, possibly this is about his own childhood, what he experienced, and now that he's old, he's, a man. he's cherishing. But look at this, how different from the romantic concept of childhood. Loneliness here is negative. It's, not a, it's no longer the bliss of solitude. It's no longer something you, you seek. And it brings, remember, memory brings good things. Memory, the memory of the... When I, when, for oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or pensive mood, when I am down, when I'm not, I have nothing to do, I remember the, the daffodils and I am happy again. But this man, I remember the past, I am even more depressed. Yeah. However, there's something, so this is about how the old days are good, are bitter, are, you know, to be cherished, to be at least remembered fondly in many ways. I love how the poem, the words and the opposites, the binary opposites, doing things. You, I'm not sure if you're doing discourse analysis this course. See how we're doing discourse analysis here. You, we train you to do things. When you translate, you pay attention to these tiny little things. And one last point. Not sure if you keep up to date with memes worldwide. What's the most uh, recent meme out there? 
No, that's very old. That's uh, this week is uh, this week this this meme is two weeks old, and in in the world of the universe of memes, this is like a century old. Mm -hmm. You wearing, can't imagine it, you can't describe it. I can't I imagine it. Okay, a guy wearing a blue vest, uh, brown vest, and I don't know. I think the, the, the most uh, uh, recent one is. Boomer. <laughs> okay, boomer. You know, boom, what's boom, other than explosions? Um, boom is like, like economic boom. No, like economic boom, like prosperity, people getting rich and something. Now, this happened after World War II, you know, after the great, the second great war when millions and millions of people uh, were killed. There was very, like, prosperity everywhere, America, the West, even Germany and Japan were, get, were getting richer and richer. Now, people born in the 20 years after the war, the war, the Second World War, are described as boomers. Now those people had it e the easiest. They had everything. They had the technology later on. Life was cheaper. There was a lot of money. So many job opportunities. Uh, even real estate uh, renting was cheap. Buying, you know, a house or a, a flat or whatever, everything was easy. And now those people are in their 60s and 70s, and these are the very people who destroyed us. These are the pe very people who caused the uh, Cold War, certain wars, uh, global warming, climate change. They destroyed everything. And those people never like anything the young people do. They're, they're always complaining about, you know, uh, condemning us, denouncing us. You have it easy here. Why are you, why are you always spending your time on, on your mobile phone, on your laptop, online, the internet? They hate everything we do. And the young people have spent a lot of time, years and years, try, trying to convince uh, those people that it was you who, cha who destroyed our challenges, who ch changed this. It was you. Hey, wake up. And by the way, those are the people who, for example, chose Trump in America, voted for Trump. Those are the people that overwhelmingly voted Brexit in England. So those are the people who are on the brink of death, but they determined the future of, for us. He, even here, we are touched by this. Look at... Trump, I think we are the most uh, important victims of Trump. Yeah, just yesterday, last night, he said the West Bank uh, uh, settlements are legal, uh, uh, moving Jerusalem and recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of, the, uh, of Israel, uh, the Golan Heights and all these. We paid the heaviest price for Trump, Palestinians. So anyway, so those recently the young people gave up on those old people who want us to live their own world view without all the perks, without all the easy stuff they got. So because the young people are fed up with their crap, they're just like, I shouldn't be saying crap, they're, they're like, okay, boomer. So meaning, okay, boomer, I don't want to talk to you anymore. You're a hopeless case. But it also means you're horrible, you destroyed our li you're destroying our lives, you took everything easy, and you kept nothing for us. So, okay, boomer. There's a video of uh, a member of the parliament from New Zealand, a young member of the parliament, 26, 27, 26, something. She was talking about climate change passionately and everything. And then an old man, a boomer, was like, you know, interrupting her and, you know, and she didn't say anything. She didn't do anything. She just said, okay, boomer. And she went back to her. <laughs> uh, so we could do the same thing here too, uh, because we didn't. Our parents always do this, and grandparents. Oh, the good old days. And we have this. Uh, you know our parents always, our father especially, like, I almost bought, you know, these areas. I almost bought that house. I almost bought this. Taiba Hajj, what did you do? <laughs> Nothing. What did you do with the money? Nothing. Okay, you lived your life, and we are now paying the prices for, for that. So, should we feel... Sad for this man, because listen, because in a way, this man wants us to live the life when he was in command, when he was in charge, when he was dominating, when he was the only, the sole authority, telling us a superstition, and we like, like and share and follow and everything for him. Here, he's alone. Nobody is following him. Nobody is sharing him. Nobody is retweeting him. He's just, he gets just one, two likes from 
the ox maybe or something. So would you say, oh yeah, the good old days? Or would you say, okay, boomer to, <laughs> to Thomas Hardy? I leave this for you and we see what next class brings to this class. Thank you very much. If you have a question, please stay behind.